What's up? What's up, guy e guys, E G guy and e. B G <laughs> on Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to everyone watching, everyone listening. I was just eating pizza. You'll have to apologize for my craziness off the top of this show. What's up, Emily? How you doing tonight? Fantastic. Anytime I get to eat pizza before I get to talk to you, I can't think of any better way than to start a show with a mouthful of pizza and <laughs> swallowing it. I'm like, let's go. I just, Brett's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I was like, get my pizza. So, uh, you know, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, but I wanted to get started by saying it's a good day when you get to start off the show by literally swallowing pizza in your mouth. So. Welcome in, everybody. Yeah, for context for anyone uh, watching that may not have heard this before, Emily literally sprints off the set from doing our 6 o'clock newscast. Of course, sports comes at the end of the news. So she sprints off the set and then shoves pizza in her mouth and then has to run <laughs> over here to get ready to do yeah. this show real quick. It was still hot, Brett. I was like, when we're <laughs> done, it's going to be cold. So I wanted to get like a few bites of hot pizza while everybody else is like enjoying, I don't know, hot dogs, hamburgers, all the things today, ribs chicken wings um i felt like this was like my little piece of peace okay yeah no yeah, hey i'm glad cool. i'm glad you got to have that <laughs> you'll be able to have some cold pizza when we're done too though <laughs> yeah 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 for sure all right let's get started with what of course we do we want to start with uh game seven yeah so i have a i have a question for you because i don't even know how i feel about this one myself necessarily i've been thinking about this all day all day uh, most of the day. Okay. Um, I can't wait to hear this. Obviously, the Heat went up 3-0 in this series, and the Celtics then won three straight to force a game seven. So the Celtics have had this massive comeback. Who should we should we be blaming the Heat yes. for giving up those three games, or should we be praising the Celtics for winning those three games and forcing game seven in Boston? And you can say both, but if you had to put the blame or the praise at the feet of one team or the other, which one are you are you going for? I'm just kidding. A second ago, I, I answered you too fast. I am absolutely <laughs> praising the Celtics. Uh, I think they became only the fourth team to be able to force a game seven after being down 0-3 in a series. So fourth team in NBA history to be able to do that in the playoffs. So, yeah, your backs were against the wall, and you – carve your way out of it uh, until tonight we'll see if you can step all the way off of the wall however uh you know when you're in these scenarios where uh, it's winter go home you got to show up and to be able to even fathom the fact that they might be able to win four in a row in this kind of like high uh, Pressure. pressure situation uh, that's insane to me and, and you know we've got to give some some I keep you know we always mention miles our producer on the show but we're gonna have to mention him again you know his like four days in October sign mm -hmm. if somehow the Celtics win tonight <laughs> that sign needs to all of a sudden say what four days in May is that yeah. what it needs to he's say? wearing a, he's pointing to his Red Sox polo he's oh, wearing there you a go, Red finally. Sox polo because yeah. the Celtics are trying to channel a little bit of that energy and pull off the 4-0 comeback um, I, I agree with you. I don't, you know, obviously you have to blame the heat a little bit. You lose three games. Um, and that was a heartbreaker. A get, heartbreaker the most recent game one, game six. six. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought, them. I thought Jimmy won that. I thought Al Horford fouled the Celtics out of the playoffs. I, obviously everyone did. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you, it's hard to blame the heat too much because when you look at these two rosters, the heat have a good roster, obviously they've been in the Eastern conference finals several years now, but on paper, the Celtics do have a better roster. So it's kind of up to the Celtics to determine which way this series was going to go. Were they going to play up to their potential and win it? Or were they going to, you know, kind of mill around like they did with the Hawks and the Sixers to an extent and let the Heat run away with it? And it looked like the first one and since they've turned it on. So I think you have to give credit to the Celtics for turning it on, for playing up to their potential. Um, and, you know, I, it's not like the Heat have just rolled over. The Heat have been right there fighting with them, especially in game six. But the Celtics have just overpowered them and just gotten it done like championship teams do. Yeah, I mean, um, I, listen, I, I like that the fact that we, we are at a game seven and it's kind of exciting because, uh, you know, for the Denver and – Lakers series that was a sweep and we that got feels like a lifetime one. ago by the right? way right and not to mention I, I want to put this out there like the Nuggets are doing media availability every <laughs> single day for the NBA finals like they're sitting there doing interviews and resting and doing whatever they want to do wouldn't surprise me yeah Scott Pennyman mentioned last week how you know when Miami because we all said that Miami was going to sweep Boston and, and you know Scott was talking about 
Miami players being out in the club after winning that game four. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if Nuggets players were like out in Denver right now having a good oh, old sure. time. It's Memorial Day weekend, like out in the clubs in Denver, like enjoying their lives because quite frankly, they swept the Lakers. They deserve some, you know, a little bit of time off. I'm sure they're meeting in the morning and, and you know, doing shoot around and whatever they do, practice uh, interviews. But other than that, at night, they're completely free. So uh, good for them. And this is, you know, what's kind of jacked up about the NBA playoffs is the fact that now you're going to have a tired either Boston team or a tired Miami team having to, you know, play a very rested Nuggets team. But, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a conversation for another day. That's the reward of winning, though. Absolutely. So here we are. Uh, I'm happy about this game seven, though. Like, let's do it. It's good for basketball. I, I say it all the time because, um, you know, you never know any given uh, postseason whether the ratings are going to be good, bad. So I think any matchup like this that goes to a game seven is good for the game of basketball, the fans, all of the things, Boston and Miami, big markets. Like, let's bring it on. OK, um, I'm excited to watch the game. I hope Fred Campagna and Miles, I hope you get what you want in the end. Of course, I'm still going for the heat. I'm sticking with the heat, but I hope that, you know, we can make a little bit of NBA history tonight, which would be cool to say that the Celtics finally became the first team to be down 0-3 in a playoff series in the NBA and move on. Yeah, they're already, like you said before, there's only been three teams to even get this far, to go down 0-3 and then to come back and win three straight and force a game seven. The first three, all three of those played the Game 7 on the road. So the Celtics are the first team to be able to do this at home. And, of course, if they pull it off, they'd be the first team to pull off the reverse sweep ever. Um, and, you know, I was I was thinking earlier, Fred Campagna um, and Miles have been just trying to hype. I keep looking over at him. He's, I know. He's praying. Guys, he has so prayer you know. hands up. Um, they've been trying <laughs> to hype. We're going to bring Miles on the show tomorrow, by the way. If, if Boston pulls it off, we're bringing him on the show, and we're going to let him um, – I'm giving you a warning, Miles, so you can prepare your speech. Uh, last week was kind of impromptu, uh, <laughs> but you can prepare your speech. If the Celtics beat the Heat tonight, I cannot wait to hear what you have to say because you're just going to lay it on me, and Scott, I know you are. Yeah, well, they've been saying stuff all day, him and Fred in our, uh, in our little Teams chat, hyping each other up. And Fred dropped a hype video that the Celtics posted <laughs> to. And it got me kind of thinking because it showed the highlights of the Red Sox coming back down 3-0 against the Yankees in the... Uh, 2004, um, 2004 ALCS, and then it showed the Patriots coming back from. Sorry, Falcons fans, back from 28-3 oh, in the oh, Super man. Bowl. So Miles I was kind of thinking, I was like, up right now. you know, we know Tom Brady, <laughs> a Tom Brady magazine. Um, you know, we know <laughs> we know Boston as the city of champions, but they're kind of becoming the city of comebacks a little bit. You have probably the two most historic comebacks in their sport already right now between the Red Sox and uh, the Patriots. And you could be adding a third. Now, the irony is the hockey team in Boston, the Bruins, are known for blowing, being the first team to blow a 3-0 lead uh, in the NHL. But, you know, if the Celtics win tonight, three out of four, that ain't too bad. I think Boston fans will take that, though. Like, yeah. let the let the NHL team be the one team that, like, blew it. Sure. They're okay with that. But they want their football team, they want their basketball team and baseball team to be the ones that actually, like, made the history. So, um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I am, like, definitely watching that game at 830. Oh, I'm watching yeah. every second of that game. And, uh, I don't know. Should I ask you who you think is going to win? I it's, want the Heat to win, though. I don't have a real opinion on who I think is going to win. I mean, it's hard to pick against the Celtics, right? They're uh-huh. at home. Yes. They have every momentum. bit of the momentum. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'm going with them. I kind of, in my heart of heart, still want the Heat just yes. because, I don't know, I love Jimmy Butler. I love the way he plays. Um, but either way, I'm honestly going to be happy because you see something historic in the Celtics completing the impossible, or you see, you know, still something kind of historic. No, in the it heat. still will be with an eight seed. Yeah, uh, eight seed going to the finals. Jimmy Butler having a chance to get that ring. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm kind of happy with either outcome. Um, my brain says Celtics. My heart 
says oh, Heat, and I'm just excited to watch. I, I really want to see how the Heat are going to respond, and I say that because I just mentioned, like, the heartbreaker of a game it was going yeah. down to the very final seconds yeah. um, in game six. Boston pulled it off, and I just want to see, like, after having your hearts ripped out of your body in that very second, knowing you have to go back to Boston in front of a rowdy crowd, how you respond. Yeah, and that's tough. We will learn a lot about the players tonight because we already know they're a physical team. We already know they know how to play defense. We already know they can guard the Celtics. Like, we know that they can do that. They showed us that in the first few games. So if they bring that kind of mentality into this game, I think they'll win. Um, but I just think, like, where is – it's kind of like the heart thing you just mentioned. Like, where is your heart? Are you able to recover from that? And they don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. No. That game's got to be gone. At 8.30 when that game tips off tonight, like, whatever happened game six happened. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. Yeah, so. 48 minutes to get it done. Um, another comeback that we're all watching tonight, especially here in Atlanta, Michael Soroka finally, finally – taking the major league mound again after what's felt like forever. I mean, it has been forever, three years since his last major league appearance. Um, before we kind of get into it, I did want to go through the timeline in case someone's not familiar. So, um, <laughs> Sorry. no, you're fine. Uh, 2020, Michael Soroka, um, star pitcher for the Braves, he was a rookie that year, was a letter, excuse me, 2019, he was a rookie, uh, finished second in rookie of the year voting, sixth in Cy Young voting, was electric. The next year, August 3rd, against the Mets in 2020, he tears his Achilles. The next year, he was trying to recover from that, re-tears the same Achilles. And ever since then, he's been, he's just been trying to get back to the major league level. Um, he's been bouncing around the minor league system, trying to rehab. Um, he's been in, I believe, in Gwinnett uh, the past few months, trying to finally crack that major league roster again. And tonight, we get to see it. He's uh, starting tonight against the Oakland A's, um, who – are the worst team in baseball. One of the worst teams you've ever All seen. So fans will be there. Yeah. So if you're uh, if you're choosing a team to finally try to make your comeback against, it's a good team. Oh, yeah. But man, it's it's hard not to root for this guy after everything he's gone through over the last three years. Finally getting a shot to come up and do it again. Um, I'm I'm excited for this one too. A few things I like about Michael Soroka. Number one, guys, from now on, and I don't know if you did it, Brett. So I'm not calling you out here. I just was trying to find some things on my phone about Michael. Um, he's no longer Mike Soroka. Yes, I saw that, actually. I did he say is, Michael. He is now Michael Soroka. So for anybody, even me, who uh, watched him, followed him the first few years of his career, it's not Mike Soroka. He just never said anything to anybody. He's like, my friends, my family, they all call me Michael. Uh, but when he got to the league, they started calling him Mike, and he just let it be. But that's not what anybody who actually knows him calls him. So Michael Soroka, you get it. Michael Soroka. Someone call you from now on. You're from Canada, so I already root for you. Oh, I didn't know he was Canadian. There <laughs> yeah. you go. He is my Canadian brother, so I already liked him before, like well before he even stepped foot on the mound. When I covered him with, you know, with the Braves in his younger days, I was like, hi, Canada. What's going on? So he's one of my people. Um, yes. His last start, did you say it, August 3rd, 2020? Yeah. Yes. That was his last start, which has been nearly three years now. Almost. Yeah. And two Achilles tears, same knee. Mm -hmm. The amount of respect I have for any athlete to keep grinding after almost three years, to have to go through a re-injury and still have hope, uh, the amount of mental uh, like reps he's had to take in his life yeah. of just like sticking with it and believing in himself, all that stuff has been insane. So um, I'm super happy for him. I honestly didn't, didn't know. I did not know if I ever thought I'd see him on the mound no. for the Braves ever I didn't again. think I didn't think we would. Yeah. The Braves stuck with him. Um, he's a great dude, so it's really easy as far as that's concerned. Um, eight starts with Gwinnett, and um, he's coming off his best start, which was Tuesday of last week. 96 pitches, uh, that's what he threw. It was the most he had thrown um, up until that point. And I think he allowed two hits, one run through six innings. Um, the manager, Brian Snicker, said, you know, once he can consistently throw about 100 pitches or more, that's when I think I'll be comfortable seeing him on our roster. And so 96 is pretty close to 100, right? 
Um, so here, here he is. Uh, he got called up, and, and he's starting tonight. And I hope, I really, really hope that it works out in his favor and it goes uh, in his direction just so he can get some confidence, Brett. Like, for me, if he gives up a couple of runs, you know, whatever, like, that's fine with me. But yeah. I, I just want to see, like, a good, strong outing from him so he can build that confidence that he's probably lacked for years now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to think. Like I said, this kid came out of the gate just – on fire. So he was good. second in rookie of the year voting, sixth yep. in Cy Young voting as a rookie. I mean, he was one went of the All-Star game. 2019. Yeah, went to the All-Star game. Um, all this when he was 22 years old, by the way. He's, I believe, well, let me pull it up he's here. He's 25 now. Yeah, he's 25 years old. So he was 22 at the time. So, I mean, his future was looking kind of like how we look at Spencer Strider now as like one of th maybe this generation's, you know, next great pitcher. Spencer Strider could be, you know, the Braves' ace for the next 15 years or so. Um, maybe not 15 years, 10 years or so. But, um, you know, that's kind of how we looked at Soroka, and then one injury just completely derails that. Yep. So he's not only coping with just trying to get back to the big leagues, but also you know it's in the back of his mind because it's in the back of all of ours. Will he ever be that guy again? Right. And I don't know what the answer to that is. No one does. Not even Michael himself knows that. But just – to be able to get back there and hopefully perform well enough to stay in the majors, you know, provide the type of life for himself and his family that you know, looks like a sure thing three years ago, um, that's huge. And I think everyone, whether you're an A's fan, whether you're a Mets or a Phillies fan, whoever, if you're a fan of baseball or just a human being, you're probably rooting for this guy tonight. A thousand percent. And, and you know, you don't have to like, you don't have to be a Braves fan, Brad. No, you just don't. If you like baseball. Tonight, you should just throw on that game and just check yeah. him out for a couple of innings, a few innings. I don't know how long he's going to last. Um, but, again, like I just hope that he can go out there and feel good about his performance. And I don't know what that is for him. I mean, obviously he wants to win, and obviously a win would be great. But I just want him to come off of that mound whenever he does and feel like, okay, like I can do this. I can yeah. still, uh, you know, perform at a high level. And, and everyone, I mean, I'm talking about everyone in that clubhouse is cheering for him. I mean, last night Acuna was like, man, I'm so proud of him. I cannot wait to see him back out there. I mean, they are supporting him like any good teammates would, but you could tell that they meant it. It wasn't just, they weren't just saying that because. Yeah. They are super happy to see him back on um, the bump for, for the Braves. And, you know, I think you mentioned it. It's not. It really wasn't that long ago before Max Fried that, yeah, Soroka was the ace. He was yeah. the Braves' ace. He started the season for the Braves. So uh, whether he gets back there or not, like you mentioned, I mean, we, we will see. But that would be, I mean, that would be such a great story if he came out there and, and looked anything like he used to look. Yeah, and he doesn't even have to be, you know, up there with Freed and Strider and Kyle Wright and these no. guys. The fourth and fifth spots in this rotation yes. are open. Yep. They are 100% open. So if he can be a good, serviceable starter, that's all the Braves need right now. Plug him into that fourth or fifth spot, which is a great situation for him because then you don't have the pressure of being that day one guy. Um, and hopefully he can, like you said, continue to build confidence and who knows, maybe turn into you know a lockdown pitcher again. Um, we'll definitely be watching that game, Emily. I also want to talk to you because you've been out at Falcons OTA a lot uh, these past few weeks. So I just want to hear what's what's going on over there. What are some uh, key position battles maybe you're seeing? What's what's happening up there? Um, it's an interesting time for the Falcons, right? Because it just feels like uh, a new era is starting because it is, and it's the Desmond Ritter era. And I don't know. I'm not sold or convinced, and I, I've said it on the show several times, only because I don't have a big enough sample size of Desmond Ritter in the NFL. In the co college, we have a huge sample size, and he was a winner, okay? He was a winner at Cincinnati through and through. It was the winningest time I think they've ever seen. Uh, so he proved himself in college, which is why he was drafted by the Falcons. But I just haven't seen him play enough NFL ball to be able to say, like, yes, I believe in him. I think he is the starter, and he'll remain the starter, and he'll be the face of the franchise for years. I'm not ready to say it, and I'm probably not going to say it for a while. However, you can tell that he has taken the reins and that, you know, um, last season he, he said it. We talked to him. He, he wasn't necessarily comfortable doing that yet, you know, and mm -hmm. rightfully so. And I think the coaches knew that, and that's why they brought in Marcus Mariota to be able to take some pressure off of him and at least show him a little bit of, of the ropes. And, and I think Mariota did exactly that. And now that Ritter, um, you know, is on his own, there's really not anybody else to me. Maybe you can tell me different in the Falcons 
uh, room, the Falcons quarterback room that looks like they could take his spot. Um, you know, he not he, day one. Right. He's he's the leader and um, he he told us he's comfortable in the offense now and, and he is very present and that's what I like about it. He's so young and you know most younger players go to voluntary OTAs. So that's what's good about him right now and, and most of the team is that they're there. <laughs> like uh, you don't have many guys who aren't there and that's because this team is just number one young or number two has so many players who just signed during free agency that are new to the team. So they're out yeah. there even though they're vets. Like Calais Campbell. I mean, he's been in the NFL for 15 years. He's 36 years old, and he's out there at OTAs. I mean, you don't see that very often, but yep. he's new to the team. He's got to catch so up. He, yep, he wants to, you know, get to learn the defense. He wants to get to uh, help the younger players. He says he's out there like he's a coach. And I think players sometimes will take advice or listen to another player before they'll listen to a coach. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just a thing. And I think that uh, especially the D-line, he'll be able to pull some players to the side and be like, hey, man, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I think a player might take it easier or better from someone like him than a coach. They might not feel as attacked or whatever the case may be. But um, it's a very interesting time right now in Flower Branch because it feels like a lot of the team is there, which, again, like it does not happen very often during this time of the year because it's yeah. voluntary. Yeah. Uh, so you can feel like you asked me, like, what's it like out there? You can definitely feel that the Desmond Ritter era has started. It's there. He's taking ownership of the offense. Um, he's one of the first people in the building. Like you talk to his teammates and they'll, they'll tell you he's usually the first guy there, which tells me that he's a good leader uh, beyond what he can do on a field. Like he's – Definitely showing up and, and trying to learn and, and wanting to be an example, even though he's so young to all the other younger guys. Uh, you've got Campbell, who I just mentioned. Um, interesting enough, Drake London, he's going into year two, and um, he was the Falcons' you know, first-round pick last year, for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, eighth overall, I believe, first-round receiver out of USC. And they drafted a corner in the fourth round, the Falcons did this year, uh, Clark Phillips the third, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, he went to Utah. Funny enough, Brett, they faced off in college all the time. And oh, really? they had, yeah, so uh, they talked about their rivalry in college with Utah and USC. So that was really, really funny to hear. I mean, they said that like they would go at it in college, but they have yet to do that um, with the Falcons. But eventually in training camp, like I would imagine that those two will get matched up and A they're lot. going to be like white on rice and go back to like their college days. Uh, but so far, so good. But they both had really cool things to say about each other. And I love to hear that they had a rivalry going on in college. Um, good on good, you know, iron sharpens iron. So I think that the fact that they have gone up against each other um, will, again, like during training camp, when we actually get to be out there for the entire practice, um, when they actually like face off, I think it'll be great for us to be able to watch them because they're definitely going to go at it. Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, yeah, that's that's good to hear. Um, I, I am I am curious because you mentioned there's all these newcomers on defense. It's not just Clayus Campbell. There's no. been a lot of new free agents um how many of those guys have showed up to otas and do they seem like they're gelling well on that side of the ball yeah i mean i think and, and every day is different right so like this week i think they get back at it wednesday and you'll you'll might see like a whole new set of guys out there um you know doing whatever they're doing so every day is different and, and you don't have to um you don't have to be there. I don't know how, right. how else to say it other than like, and the Falcons only open it up to us once a week. So even though I might see a couple of players one day, they might be gone the next or whatever the case may be. So um, I think a good group of them are there though. Like a really good group of them are there getting to learn um, a lot. And it's always interesting to see the rookies out there with the vets, which is probably the most important is for rookies and vets to get to know each other, to start yeah. gelling, uh, for the chemistry to start building. So so for a team like the Falcons, again, I keep saying it, for such a young team, I think it's important. This time of the year is especially important versus another team that might have a bunch of vets. And, I mean, <laughs> they're enjoying their summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And for those who maybe aren't as plugged into the NFL this time of year, that's really – that's not just like a Falcons thing. That's across the league that – Vets aren't or really anyone. I mean, rookies kind of are, but anyone who's been in the league a few years, they're not really expected to go to OTAs. If they do, great. But I think most teams respect their players, especially their good players that have proven, like, I show up, you know, when, um, you know, when training camp starts and I, um, you know, I play, I play well. Um, most teams 
trust those guys to do whatever offseason conditioning they need to do. Um, I know Arthur Smith came from Tennessee. I was in Nashville at the time, and it was like less than half of yeah. guys would show up to OTAs. I mean, big guys like Kevin Byard, uh, Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry. Um, I know A.J. Brown. They never showed up to OTAs. So that's not an uncommon thing it's at all. It's not frowned upon, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty well accepted across the league. Um, organizations mostly trust their guys to do what's right for them, and then they'll show up when they need to. Yeah, there will be mandatory mini camp at yeah. the end of the month or maybe, uh, I guess, June, at the end yeah. of June. Uh, then they get a whole month off, like like five to six weeks. Six would be the maximum there. Um, and then they're back for training camp, and then the season starts. So it's funny to always see that. Like mandatory mini camp, everybody shows up, and then the last day of mini camp, everybody's out of there by like noon. And I'm talking about everyone, not just players, like yeah. all the way up to the general manager, and they're out for like yeah. five weeks. Don't talk to me. Don't call me. Like, That's their last bit of freedom until <laughs> yeah, the grind it starts. It is what it is. So um, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because it's we you know it, it's at this time of the year it's voluntary, but again it's just a lot about chemistry building. So. Yeah. Well, Emily, we're uh, we're flying ahead of schedule tonight, which is fine by me because I got a lot of work to do. Uh, so eat. I'll ask you quickly, what's on your mind? Ethan Quinn. You don't know who that is, do you? I have no idea who that is. I don't is. expect you to know who he is, but you're going to want to remember that name. Okay. And years from now, BG, when you hear it again, I want you to shoot me a text, give me a call. So he is a redshirt freshman at UGA. Okay. He won a national championship over the weekend in singles tennis player oh okay baller okay All right. he's a young buck like young young red shirt freshman wins the singles title All from right. uga he's originally from california like he's from the west coast super cool dude i've talked to him and you could tell he's from the west coast when you sit down with him nothing really bothers him mm -hmm. he's just kind of like one of those cool collected guys um only three uga players in the history of their tennis program has been able to win a singles title wow and they're one of the best teams in the country when it comes to tennis. Wow. So when I put it that way, three dogs have been able to win a singles title, once again, an NCAA championship, okay, singles title. Um, and then I just want to put this out here, and I'm gonna, I want to say it correctly, so I'm going to read it directly from here. He's the fourth freshman to claim the crown since 1977 and the Across. first Georgia player to advance to the final since John Isner. In 2007. Wow. We all know who John Isner is, okay? So we're talking about Ethan Quinn in the same company okay. as um, John Isner. So uh, don't be surprised when you see him competing on the biggest stages of tennis in the coming years because this kid is the real deal. It's, right. it's so tough to win a singles title in tennis, so tough. But <laughs> he did it as a redshirt freshman. Okay, I'm sold. I'll, uh, I'll look him up after this. Yeah. What's on my mind tonight is actually the Braves' opponent tonight for that uh, Michael Soroka game, okay. the Oakland A's. And we all know they're pretty bad. Um, you know, I feel like every other week we see a stat about how they're on pace to have the worst <laughs> record since the Cleveland Spiders in 1882 or whatever. Uh, but I have an A's friend who actually texted this to me today, and this, like, really put into the perspective for me how bad they are. So I'm also going to read this off because I want to get it right. So the biggest gap across – Major leagues right now, from first place to last place in a division, is in the AL Central. It's 11 games. So the Royals and the AL Central are 11 games back from the Twins. Except okay. in the AL West, where the Oakland A's are 18 and a half games back <laughs> from fourth. Not from first place. They're that far behind fourth place. That's crazy. This team does not want to win. And I'm not talking about the players. I'm talking about the management and the ownership. But they do not want to win. They are not competing in good faith. And it's terrible for baseball. And I just needed to get that off my chest. It is terrible for baseball. And you can't be mad when they leave. And they join the Raiders in Vegas. Yeah, like, I mean, if you live in Oakland, you can. I mean, okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to you're gonna have to blame the owners, like yes. you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can't be mad at it. Because, like, what's happening here? What is happening? It's disgusting. It, that's yes, all. That's all I had to say. I just want to get that off my chest a little bit. All right. Can we eat some pizza now? Yeah. Let's go do it. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. Thanks for watching. All right. See y'all.